Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Welcome to World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. The Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to expanding awareness among the American public and the international community of geopolitical, business, and civil society issues in our interconnected world. The Council provides a neutral forum for world leaders, economists, diplomats, scholars, CEOs, journalists, Nobel laureates, authors, and others. They join Council members, guests, and online audiences for in-depth discussions of today's foreign policy and education issues of global importance. Each year, thousands of individuals participate in these programs, and hundreds of thousands view these events via our website, worldaffairsdc.org. In this program series, we are pleased to be bringing these weekly presentations to MHC Worldview. Hosted in our nation's capital, World Affairs Today examines critical issues of U.S. foreign policy and international relations. We hope that you will enjoy these programs and share them with your family and friends. Here's what our distinguished board has said about council programs. Hey, I'm Pat Gross, and I'm one of the uh, two founders of the World Affairs Council, Leonard Marks, and I uh, started the council back in 1980. Uh, we did so because Washington, D.C. was one of the only major cities in the country that didn't have a forum where people that were interested in world affairs could come and hear leaders of foreign policy in the United States, international leaders of foreign policy, speak and uh, respond to questions. We select programs really based upon what is a very topical subject, uh, whether it be uh, the, the war on terror, uh, the uh, international economy, uh, environmental issues which are global. So the topics that we focus on are truly global international issues that are frankly uh, in, in front of the public and where we would like to know in more detail about what is going on on a global basis. At the end of the day we're all citizens of this great country and part of the obligation I think and, and joy of being a citizen is having some view about the policies that your government is uh, engaging in. And almost all those policies have an international flavor and it's very hard to stay on top of this by yourself. It's almost impossible. I mean, I take three newspapers a day. I seem to be reading all the time and I'm a businessman, but I can't stay on top of this. But one way you can make a dent in it is to be involved in the council. To prepare our youth to compete in the 21st century arena, the Council helps expand and enrich the global education and international affairs knowledge in the curricula offered by our country's school systems. The Council's teacher development workshops, issue seminars, youth leadership forums, academic WorldQuest competitions, internships, and international travel study tours foster an enhanced understanding of global issues. Later this year, we will launch a second series dedicated to educators and their students. Please check our website for the premier date announcement and program scheduling. In the coming weeks, World Affairs Today programs will feature retired General Michael Hayden, a former National Security Advisor and former Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, talking about the global challenges of cybersecurity. Dr. John Esposito, one of America's leading scholars on Islam, will examine the global implications of Islamophobia. Michael Schur, former head of the CIA's Bin Laden unit, will discuss his newest book, Osama Bin Laden. The tragic situation in Haiti will be the topic of a foreign policy panel discussion, as will the outcomes and consequences of the Southern Sudanese referendum on independence from Sudan. Finally, one of America's top analysts on the Middle East, Ambassador Chaz Freeman, will discuss what he describes as America's misadventures in that troubled region. And now, today's program brings you the Deputy Secretary of Defense, William J. Lynn III, 
who examines the efforts underway within the Pentagon to curb the growing defense budget without compromising our capabilities and readiness. Thank you for joining us on World Affairs today. We welcome your comments and questions via email at worldaffairsdc.org, on Facebook, or by phone. If you are in the Washington, D.C. area and would like to attend one of our live programs, please visit worldaffairsdc.org for scheduling information. Thank you. Let me welcome all of you here. We really greatly appreciate it. Uh, the World Affairs Council benefits by your presence, by your support, and by your involvement, and so thank you for being here. I want to talk a little bit about our speaker and a little bit about the environment in which uh, he will speak into. Um, it's an era, I think we can all agree, it's an era of profound change. It's an era of what many people have called an era of global competition. We have obvious national security interests. The United States is involved in at least two wars, depending on how you count. But beyond the traditional, we're also involved in other kinds of issues, the global commons, cyber, for example, Economic security is an issue of national security, where questions of efficiency and affordability are critical. And our speaker is extraordinarily well qualified to deal with all those issues. He has both a law degree and a master's in public policy. He knows the private sector, having worked in several capacities. He knows the think tank world, and he knows the government. Among the many positions that he's held. He's worked in the Congress for Senator Kennedy with a focus on the Armed Services Committee. He's worked at the National Defense University and at the Institute for Defense Analyses. He's been the comptroller of the Department of Defense as well as the director of program analysis and evaluation. And in the last several months, he's led the Defense Department on issues of affordability and on cyber and at the same time, understanding what I would call a full context of the changing nature of the world. And he, in fact, gave a speech on the changing nature of war, uh, which is well worth uh, everyone's looking at. He, his article, which was just recently published in Foreign Affairs on Cyber, is really required reading now. So let me welcome our speaker, the current Deputy Secretary of Defense, both a pragmatist and a visionary, and a colleague and a good friend, William Lynn. And let me present Bill with the award. And, and Bill, if I can give you the International Affairs Leadership Award with the compliments and thanks from the council. Th thanks very much, Frank. I, I didn't think you got the award until after you saw how the speech went, so I, I <laughs> appreciate that. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to come uh, before you and uh, uh, talk some about national security. Uh, as was uh, recited in the introduction, Frank and I have had a, a terrific relationship, uh, worked together for the past couple of decades in, uh, in several different uh, uh, positions and uh, certainly uh, maybe look at uh, some future uh, opportunities as, as well. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the, uh, the, the council here. I actually am bi-coastal. I, I spoke before your uh, LA affiliate uh, earlier in the year and so uh, I'm, I'm glad they didn't uh, report badly to you. Um, as, uh, as Frank noted, uh, I've uh, been unable to hold a job and have, have moved uh, uh, multiple times, uh, which has made uh, life in this job a bit difficult because I, I've seen all sides of it now. I, I spent uh, six years, as Frank noted, in, in Congress, and, and at that point, life was, was pretty straightforward. I pretty much understood that the, uh, the Defense Department, the administration, was narrow-minded and, and bureaucratic. And, <laughs> didn't really understand the problems the way we in Congress did. Um, uh, unfortunately, then I moved into the Clinton administration for eight years and, and quickly discovered that, that Congress was actually parochial and narrow-minded and didn't understand the, the full depth of the, the 
challenges the way we did in the administration. I uh, then went to uh, work in the, in the private sector and realized that both the Congress and the administration <laughs> were narrow-minded, parochial, didn't understand the problems of the private sector and the, and the depth of uh, commitment that was. Uh, so now I'm back in the, uh, in the executive branch, and I, I don't have anybody to blame. And so that, that's uh, become a, a challenge as I try and uh, work through the issues. What I'd like to, to talk about with you today is uh, Secretary Gates, uh, we call it the Efficiencies Initiative. We, we probably need to have a naming contest. That's, that doesn't quite capture what he's trying to do, but I'd like to describe it to you in some detail and then, and then move and take uh, whatever questions you have. You start, I think it's good to put uh, things in historical perspective. We're at what I would call the fifth inflection point in the post-World War II era in terms of defense spending and, and defense structure. We've had four prior significant transitions. Uh, three of them followed wars, world, uh, the transition after World War II, the transition after Korea, and then the transition after the uh, Vietnam conflict. And then the, uh, the fourth one really came as a direct result of uh, deficits and uh, the Graham-Rudman uh, legislation in the mid-1980s and then it was followed on by the, the collapse of the uh, 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 Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, and the fall of the, the Berlin Wall. Uh, so that one was more, that had some international uh, direction, but it also was uh, somewhat like what we face today. It was uh, deficit uh, driven. Now what these four transitions have in, in common is that each time the department has gone through this, we've, we've suffered a, uh, a, in one way or another, a disproportionate loss of uh, capability. So in, a, in shorthand, we're 0 for 4 uh, in terms of managing these transition, transitions. Now, Secretary Gates is, uh, was a history major, and he's clearly conscious of this history. And he can see, obviously, the fiscal pressure the nation is under. And so he undertook an effort to try and manage that pressure so that we would be able to manage this transition so as not to disrupt the capabilities and the qualities that we have in the military right now. In short, we don't want to break the force, we, but we do want to adapt to the fiscal situation we're in. We're clearly not going to see double-digit growth uh, the way we have the past decade. And so all of that kind of thinking led the Secretary to the Efficiencies Initiative he, we came at this, again, looking at history and saying that there are three lessons that you might draw, derive from those four earlier transitions. The first, and it's a basic management technique, but it's reinforced in these uh, transitions, is you have to make hard decisions early. The budget pressure is not going to get better. In fact, it's probably going to get worse in, in both directions, in that the costs of our program, if history is a guide, are going to grow. Now, we're trying to take steps to restrain that cost growth, but uh, in anticipation of not being fully successful there, you have to anticipate the costs of each program are going to grow beyond what they are today or what they're estimated to be today. And if anything, resources are going to be fewer. So we're, if you cannot afford it now, you clearly are not going to be able to afford it in the future when uh, the funds are tighter. So make hard decisions early is the first lesson. Second, it's not possible to generate the kind of savings that we're talking about with what I would call pure efficiencies. And by pure efficiencies, I mean efficiencies where you do the same thing for less money, that you increase productivity, you improve your IT systems, you get more out of what you're doing. It is possible to generate pure efficiencies, and we're certainly trying to do that, but we've set a target of $100 billion, and I'll explain how we got that in a minute. But you, we're probably not going to be able to get $100 billion of pure efficiencies in the overhead of the department. So rule two in the looking at historical transitions is you cannot rely solely on pure efficiencies. You are going to have to eliminate low priority activities, low priority organizations. You're going to have to make some decisions that were things, there are things that are still generating value, but in the, in the budget and fiscal environment that we're in, they just don't rate priority uh, in the program. These are, these are tough decisions. 
Uh, you've already seen an example of one. I would put the, our decision to disestablish the Joint Forces Command, uh, to recommend that to the President. I would put that in this category. The purpose of the Joint Forces Command was to ensure that a military that was once service-centric would embrace joint operations and joint doctrine. We've come a long way since the 1980s and 90s when that idea was developed. And as a matter of practice and necessity, the military has embraced jointness doctrinally, operationally, and culturally. Because of that success, it's not a complete success, but we have made substantial progress. Because of that progress and that success, we don't believe we need a four-star command with a billion-dollar budget to continue to foster jointness. So that, it's not that they were doing things that weren't of value. It's in this environment we have to make these kinds of uh, tough decisions. The third lesson is that you have to approach these kinds of transitions in defense spending in a balanced way. You cannot focus all of your attention on one area of the budget. If you take disproportionate reductions from the investment accounts, it's going to lead to gaps in our modernization, our technology, and where it's going to lead to aging of our equipment. But similarly, if you take disproportionate reductions out of the operating accounts, that will force uh, cuts in, in, in uh, bases, leading uh, to, to uh, poor, a poor base structure, and it will uh, degrade operational readiness. So as we approached these, this efficiencies initiative, we wanted to approach it with those three lessons in mind. Now, this is not something that Secretary Gates just uh, came up with last spring when he gave the speech uh, at Abilene. He's been talking about this direction uh, at least since uh, October of 2008. Started at, at that point, he gave a major speech, I think it was at NDU, uh, and he started to talk about the problems we face and the challenges of this, in, this inflection point. Now, at that point, he thought he was going to be punting these issues to the next administration. He had no idea he would be fielding that punt as well. Um, but in fielding that punt, he's taken this on with incredible energy. And he started in April 2009 with the first uh, budget of the Obama administration. He started making those tough decisions I talked about. We cut programs like the presidential helicopter that were, that were too troubled to continue. We cut programs where we had enough capability like the, uh, the F-22. Overall, uh, Secretary Gates uh, proposed in Congress to approve uh, substantial reductions or termination of more than 20 programs and about $300 billion. Uh, billion. The next step in this focus on a transition is, was the speech at the Eisenhower Library this past a April, where he, he talked about four, he talked about four tracks in terms of moving resources from overhead into the war, into the war fighting accounts. His starting point was the situation that we face in the world today, where we don't think we're in a position to reduce force structure at least not in the immediate term. We still have 50,000 troops in Iraq. We still have nearly 100,000 in Afghanistan. Uh, and we have counter-terror commitments around the world. These commitments have led us to uh, have at least temporary increases in the, in the Marine Corps and the Army. And they caused us to halt planned reductions in the Navy and the Air Force. For the, the, at least the midterm, this is not the time to be reducing force structure. So if you can't reduce force structure, how do you uh, develop a budget that supports the 2 to 3 percent real growth that history tells you is what's needed to maintain a, the technologically advanced and highly capable forces we have today? The 2 to 3 percent comes from looking at the modernization accounts, where cutting edge technology takes a pace greater than inflation. Also looked at the operating accounts, where some costs, uh, qu some quality of life costs, medical care, grow at faster paces than inflation. So you need 2 to 3 percent uh, growth, but we have a budget right now where we have a top line increase, planned increase of about 1 percent beyond inflation. We don't think it's responsible, we don't think it would be successful 
to ask the Congress and the American taxpayers to increase beyond that 1 percent, especially if we have not looked hard at all of the accounts ourselves. And that is, as I said, what led to the $100 billion. We have analyzed it, and if we can move $100 billion from overhead accounts into the warfighting accounts, that will give us that 2 to 3 percent growth that history tells you you need in the warfighting accounts. And you can do it within the 1 percent top line growth. That's where the, that $100 billion, uh, $100 billion number comes from. Now, understanding how we're doing this is even more complicated than that because not all overhead is in the overhead accounts. There is, it is possible to do things more efficiently and effectively in the warfighting accounts, and we wanted to drive that as well. And that's where the two-third, one-third break, where we're trying to get two-thirds transfer of the $100 billion from the overhead accounts into the warfighting accounts, and one-third of the $100 billion we're trying to get from efficiencies inside the warfighting accounts themselves. Now, how do we do that without losing fighting power? Well, for example, we've just uh, signed a, a, a contract to build the F-18 on a multi-year contract. That's going to allow $600 million worth of savings. That's an efficiency that we can then reapply to the warfighting account. So that's, that's we think, and we think we can get a third or so of the resources that we need that way, but two-thirds of that $100 billion is still going to have to come from those warfighting accounts. And those efforts to achieve this $100 billion, that is track one of the four-track initiative that the Secretary has embarked on. Now, to ensure that these savings are kept in the warfighting accounts and applied appropriately, we're allowing the services to keep the savings that they generate and apply them to their warfighting needs. This is not a budget drill designed to reduce the top line. We are talking about reallocating within that 1 percent real growth that the President has planned for the Defense Department and trying to generate warfighting growth of 2 to 3 percent within that to, uh, uh, to give us the, what we need in terms of modernization. Track two of the four-track initiative is essentially an outside pull. We are asking others for ideas, think tanks, scholars, industry, and, and DOD's own employees. We've set up a program called INVEST, ask the people who are closest to the defense enterprise, our employees, for their ideas on reducing overhead and saving resources, and we've gotten so far 15,000 of them, which we're uh, in evaluating at this point. The point of the overall outside initiative, though, is to ensure that we get a diverse perspective and that we consider every idea that has merit to improve our operations and to change the way we do business. Track three of the Secretary's efficiency initiative is focused on systemic change to the processes and the organizations that operate the department. Sometimes our own bureaucratic processes make our contractors and offices behave inefficiently. As a first step, the Undersecretary for Acquisition, Ash Carter, and the Secretary detailed 23 initiatives in the way we operate our acquisition system. And let me highlight just two of those. First, Dr. Carter's described a need to buy services with the same rigor that we buy equipment. We spend almost 200, we spend over $200 billion a year on services. Whereas in the, in the equipment area, we have trained buyers, people who are uh, trained to buy and spend their careers buying equipment, that they, they have developed techniques and negotiation approaches, they have expertise in writing contracts. In the service area, we don't have that same expertise. The people who buy services predominantly are doing some other job and they're buying services as, a, as, a, as an extra duty. It's something that they're doing to support their other job. So we need to enable them to have the same kind of expertise that our equipment buyers have. And we've embarked on a series of training and techniques and best practices where we think we can up our game in the services area and that this is a real opportunity for savings in that $200 billion that we spend annually on service contracts. Second, we need to ensure that government and industry incentives 
converge where, where it's possible and where it's appropriate. In other words, we need to incentivize both government and industry to bring in programs on schedule and on or under budget. There are several tools that we can use to strengthen the, this connection. First, we can look at fixed price incentive contracts for development. We learned lessons in the late 80s and early 90s with some poorly structured contracts that, for, that we ought to just use cost plus contracts for development. I think that was an oversteer. Although there were some high profile failures, uh, cost plus contracts lead to a divergence of incentives in many cases between government and industry that you can correct with fixed price incentive. Now you can't use fixed price incentive contracts in every development where you're inventing new technology very difficult, you can't use. There you do have to use cost plus and you just have to manage those incentives. But where the government knows what it wants and doesn't change its mind, and where industry possesses the processes and understands the technology, we can indeed use fixed price incentive contracts to give us more certainty in that we're gonna bring in those programs on, pro on schedule and on budget. The fourth track, the final track, consists of a series of items the Secretary announced last August to try and jumpstart the process, to jumpstart the process of change in how the department does business. Track four is intended to be and is separate from the normal programming and budget process. In it, Secretary Gates asked his staff to particularly challenge the headquarters and support bureaucracies that operate in the Department of Defense. At DOD, it's a very large organization, and not surprisingly, we have layering and we have duplication of effort. In an effort to flatten and streamline our institutions, we've undertaken track four. Now, this track will undoubtedly save money, eliminating headquarters, thinning out organizations, uh, uh, reducing uh, support contracts will save some money. But equally important is it will also improve our operational agility, will improve the way we do business. And towards those twin objectives of saving money and operational agility, the Secretary announced eight initiatives in August. He announced efforts to reduce support contracts. And by support contracts, I don't mean all contractors. I mean contractors that are essentially staff augmentation to DOD. It's grown from 26% of our workforce to 39% over a decade. It wasn't really a thought out growth and that we're, we've uh, put in place some reduction targets to try and bring that back into balance. To pre prevent that staff increases from just shifting to another area, we've instituted a civilian personnel freeze and we've particularly focused on senior grades and the SESs. There's been a growth of about 300 SESs since uh, 2001. As a target, we're looking to eliminate at least half of that growth. Similarly, on flag and general officers, there's been a growth of about 100, similar target of eliminating about half of that growth. We're also looking to achieve economies of scale, especially in the uh, information technology area. We want to eliminate unneeded oversight reports and studies, both ones that we issue ourselves as well as discussing with Congress ones that they issue us. We want to cut down on the 60-plus outside boards and commissions that we have. And we're working with General Clapper, the new Director of National Intelligence, to reduce duplication in our intelligence organization. Finally, Secretary Gates, as part of the August announcements, announced his proposal to disestablish three major Department of Defense organizations. The Business Transformation Agency, we believe, is duplicative of the, the, the Deputy Chief Management Officer that Congress created in 2008. And with the DCMO, we don't think we need a standalone agency to do these overlapping functions. And so we're going to concentrate on the DCMO function and we're going to eliminate the Business Transformation Agency. The, the NII office, the, uh, the, which is the, what's left of this, what was C cubed I back in the 90s, and then the intelligence uh, was broken out into a separate undersecretary. That function is not just uh, contained in NII, it's in J6, it's in DISA, it's in now the new Cyber Command. 
we think that we can eliminate NII and combine the, the other organizations, eliminate NII and J6, and realign the other organizations and build a stronger chief information officer function in the Department of Defense with lesser staffing. Finally, the Joint Forces Command. As I said earlier, we don't think we're any longer a service-centric military, and ensuring jointness, no long, uh, while an important goal, no longer requires that four-star command with that billion-dollar budget. In each of these decisions, the Secretary and I are trying to apply the historical lessons that I described of the, previ of the four earlier post-World War II transitions. We've tried to make the hard decisions early. We've tried to move beyond seeking just pure efficiencies in the program and are attacking lower priority items. And we're trying to ensure that the reductions we do take are done, across a, done in a balanced fashion so that neither operational nor modernization accounts are disproportionately impacted. In conclusion, with forces deployed abroad, fiscal pressures at home, we face a very complex environment. It's going to require careful management on the part of the department, but circumstances have created this inflection point in defense spending, and to ensure that we maintain forces in this fifth post-World War II transition, we believe we actively need to seek savings and achieve efficiencies in the warfighting accounts and shift resources from the overhead accounts into those warfighting accounts. Our effort to seek these efficiencies is not a sprint, it's a marathon, but it's a race we must win. The alternative is unacceptable. Be to manage the transition upon us in an ineffective and unbalanced way. To ensure our forces remain strong through a time of tight budgets, we've designed a program of efficiencies that establish reasonable reduction targets focused on specific savings, in which we think we can develop a program that will give, the, give us the warfighting capabilities we continue to need in this era of fiscal austerity. Thanks very much. Uh, Bill, thank you very much. I think it's pretty clear you deserve the award. Uh, wasn't much of a risk giving it to you beforehand. Uh, I've got a series of questions, and I encourage uh, other folks who have questions to send them up. And You're let me start. Out the hard ones, right? I'm going to start with the easy ones, um, and then we'll move on to the harder ones. Uh, but just one that uh, you focused on a little bit yourself. Um, the question is, how will the Joint Forces Command's responsibilities be divided up if, if the particular function itself is stood down as is currently the plan? I, I think the role for maintaining uh, jointness in the force uh, will fall in a number of areas, but it will fall heavily on the chairman and the vice chairman supported by the joint staff. And a, uh, a related question, and this is one which I think I know the answer to, but, but the question really is, as you pointed out, uh, Secretary Gates started these initiatives really in the prior administration and then you know, caught his own punt, as you, as you said. And the question becomes, what happens if, as is widely rumored, uh, he leaves, whether, you know, let's say next March or something like that. Um, he has very good bipartisan support, having worked in both administrations. Uh, there are modest difficulties between the parties, I would say, uh, up on the Hill. Is this the kind of thing that you think, based on your own experience with the, with the Hill, we will see congressional support for, or is it going to turn into more of a, uh, of a partisan type issue? I don't think it's turned into a, a, a partisan issue. I mean, I, I think there are two answers to the, the question. One is the Secretary hasn't set a, a, any date for leaving that I'm aware of, and he is committed to this, and he is trying to put in place uh, the foundation and the framework to, uh, to accomplish these goals and to, to gain the savings and shift the funding into the warfighting accounts. Second, even after he goes, the, uh, whenever that is, the situation will still be the same. We will still face the challenges we face internationally. We will still have the fiscal pressure we face. And I think we will be driven 
to do the things uh, that we're talking about. And I think he's put in place a good plan. I think that I know the president is is committed to it, and I think uh, uh, the uh, his successor, whenever that that individual takes office, will uh, most likely follow up very strongly. Uh, with regard to to Congress, I mean there are going to be specific issues that Congress has, uh, and and we've we've. We've already heard on, uh, from them on some of those. Uh, but I think as a general matter, I think Congress understands the need for what the Secretary is doing and, the, the, and supports the direction he, uh, he's, he's going. There'll be certainly disputes over individual issues. Uh, one of the uh, things that you mentioned in, the, uh, in your speech was the, the point about you can use a fixed price uh, incentive contract for development, and then you use the phrase somewhere in there, if the requirements don't change. Yes. And one of the issues, of course, is uh, we all seek to give our people in uniform the absolute best. And that is the rationale normally for the requirements changing. Mm -hmm. So the question, I think, is how do you balance that off? How do you, how do you try to figure out how much do you seek, how much can you push, and when do you sort of fix those requirements? And then how do you get that sense down to the individual program manager? Well, I mean, I think, I think you're right. Pe people are not, you know, intentionally doing things that are not in the interests of the taxpayer, not in the interests of, the, of our, our, our men and women in uniform. But the incentives aren't always there. I mean, there, there is a, if you look at the micro level, if there's a capability that might improve a particular system, of course you want it. And you're not in a position at a, at a micro level to think about, well, what's the opportunity cost? If I seek that capability and increase the cost and delay the schedule, what am I pushing out of the budget? Because almost surely the budget isn't going up to accommodate that. So you're pushing something out. That judgment has to be made at a higher level. For that reason, we're putting in what we call configuration boards so that judgments about whether to gain that capability, because sometimes there's going to be new capabilities that indeed you do want to add to systems. But you want that judgment to be made at a sufficiently high level that it's considering the opportunity costs that you're taking either in terms of delaying the fielding of that system or uh, driving funding out of, out of some other system. So that, that's one change in incentives we're trying to do by, by changing where requirements uh, can be changed. The other is, again, what I was saying about converging incentives with industry and the government. If you have a fixed price incentive contract, it is not an industry's interest to accept changes unless they're going to be paid, paid for. And so they, they will, industry will be a break on those changes and will, unless you change the contract. And that, too, forces things up so that the decisions, it's not that you will never make decisions to do those improvements, but you will do fewer of them and you'll do them uh, understanding better uh, what your opportunity costs are. I think you heard uh, earlier that we are going to have a program on the December 15th with uh, former Secretary Perry uh, and former National Security Advisor Steve Hadley. Uh, both of them ran the so-called quadrennial defense review, review so to speak. Right. Uh, and that made a series of recommendations, one of which, uh, got, which got a lot of attention, at least in some quarters, was with respect to the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, that in substance that there ought to be a, a real focus on increasing the size of the Navy, if I simplify what they said. Um, on the one hand, how do you take into account their review in your process? And then specifically with respect to the Navy side, are you able to say anything about that one way or another? Yeah, no, I certainly read the report and met with, uh, with both, uh, well, the whole, the whole commission as well as uh, individually with uh, Steve Hadley and Bill Perry. Uh, their proposal uh, for increasing the size of the Navy is indeed the direction of the, the shipbuilding program we have, which is to build from, what well, I think we're in the 280s now in terms of, uh, of ships, and this would build to the low 300, 310, 320. There's no, you can never establish a single number target because things, ships retire and enter service in a year and there's no fixed target, but we are going in the direction, and I think actually they put a number out, uh, and I think if you do an apples to apples comparison of their number, they they counted some things that aren't normally counted in the shipbuilding count. If you uh, adjust for that, what we're talking about is, is generally in the range of, of what they're talking about. But that does require that the, the initiatives that Ash Carter has talked about to be successful. That in other words, we, that we have to have 
programs that are going to stay on cost and on budget. And so things like re uh, changing the way we were competing the littoral combat ship, where we, we went from an allocation to a true competition, and we've gotten, frankly, much better uh, um, uh, bids doing that. That's going to allow us, I think, to, to those kinds of steps are going to allow us to have the budget that we need to buy the ships to get the, that increase in the, in the Navy that they're talking about. Somebody raised the question, uh, let me see if I can read it right. Looking at what the world spends on defense, uh, are we spending too much? And the, the background, as you well know, is that we spend about the same as the rest of the world combined, again, in, in very round numbers. Uh, there are reasons for that, of course, but what's your view as to whether or not either we're spending too much or alternatively, are other people, allies, spending too little? I mean, I think it's always useful to, to do those kinds of benchmarks and, and look at world defense spending, although you have to recognize that many countries don't capture all the elements of spending that we capture inside, uh, for example, health care and many, and many uh, uh, defense budgets is outside the defense budget entirely, and I mean, much of the personnel costs are outside the de their defense budget entirely. So it, it, it's also useful, the other me broad metric people use is, is percentage of the economy. Uh, and again, that's, that's, that's a useful tool if you want to know what kind of uh, burden defense is putting on the economy. What's, what's the premium, insurance premium you're paying for national security? Useful for that. Neither, however, are a very good measure of what you should be spending. Uh, what you should be spending is what you think you need to d deal with the threats along the lines, of, uh, deal with the threats along the lines of the strategy that the nation has adopted. That's, that's how we have gotten the defense budget we think we need. I think we can defend it in detail. Uh, and, so I, and I don't think you can simply say, well, I want to change either up or down the percentage of GDP and make a coherent argument to say, well, that's then what's needed for national security. I think you have to do it by each. Is what threats do you think you need, need to uh, address? How do you plan to address those threats? What does that lead to you in terms of forces and what budget do you need to support those forces? That's the, the path that we went through in the QDR and the, and the subsequent analyses. That's what led us to where we, uh, where we are. The other things, I think, are just benchmarks against that. I have a couple of, I have a couple of questions on the uh, impact of uh, efficiencies uh, on the all-volunteer force. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one says, how do you think the volunteer recruitment will hold up as a result of the uh, issues of uh, reform uh, as well as the wars uh, that are ongoing? And the second says, uh, given the large cost increases in maintaining our current force structure, how can we continue to have an all-volunteer force? Now, I know you were engaged in thinking about that you know, for a long time, but what about effectiveness on the all-volunteer force, and what about the impact of the deployments uh, overseas? I mean, the all-volunteer force is, is given us the, the best military the world's ever seen. I, I, I don't think there's any consideration, at least in this administration, to change that. Uh, that said, the questions are valid. Um, in particular, I, I don't think the reform effort is, has, uh, is, is something that's going to have a, a, a harmful effect on, on force. It's designed to have a, a powerfully positive incentive by delivering resources to where they're needed in the, in the war fighting end of the operation, vice and the administrative end. So I, I don't think you're going to see uh, that. That said, embedded in the question was, uh, what about the effect of the wars? I, that is indeed, I think, where we have to focus and where we are trying to focus. We, we're now, have, we've now been at war in, in, uh, in Iraq and then now in Afghanistan for as long as this nation has, has, has been uh, uh, in, in decades. And that is taking a toll on the force. Repeated deployments, uh, time away from families, that indeed takes a toll on the force. And that is one of the reasons I'm saying we cannot reduce force structure. Indeed, we had to increase force structure because we need better dwell times. We need the force to be able to spend more time at home uh, compared to how much time they spend uh, in, in combat in theater. And, and I think that is the best thing that we can do in terms of, of preserving this high quality force. And, and being true to the men and women who have committed themselves to it. 
Just in that regard, the, the health portion of the defense budget certainly has gone up uh, yes. since you and I started playing this game. Um, and the, what you just mentioned, the uh, impact, of course, of war drives it up further. Traumatic brain injury is a, a huge mm -hmm. issue, post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. um, are those things where uh, the department is going to put a lot more money? I know that it's putting money in it already. Is that an area that one could expect to see grow as we s spend money on health? Oh, I think, I mean, traumatic brain injury is certainly we're going to spend more money. On re we're spending, we're doing everything we, we can right now, but I, I think that uh, that's the signature injury uh, sure. in, the, in this war, and it's, it's something that we, we really need to, uh, need to understand better. And so we, we've just uh, opened a, a, the Intrepid Center uh, up at Bethesda. And, and, uh, Why don't that you and tell others. people what that is? The yeah, it's, a, it's a center focused on traumatic brain injury, uh, uh, largely done with uh, private contributions, but it's, uh, it's up at the Bethesda, um, the Naval Medical Facility at Beth Bethesda, and it's a... a Terrific, cutting-edge uh, uh, institution that helps uh, our uh, men and women deal with these these injuries. And there's some we have other centers and other, and we're doing it as much. Re we're doing research uh, to try and address these uh, on these problems, which are they are not new, but our 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 ability to deal with them is growing. Let me switch to some of the uh, international issues. Uh, one question, well, there are actually two that are related. One says, uh, please comment on any plans to reduce U.S. bases around the world, and then more specifically, a question on the future of U.S. forces in Europe. And, of course, that involves, the, the among others, the brigade combat right. teams. The, I mean, that's, that's some, that, those are decisions you, you do as much as you can in a quadrennial defense review, but, in fact, you can't boil the ocean. You cannot get every issue addressed, and and uh, the the global for force posture issues are uh, the subjects of subsequent reviews that are ongoing now. So the the brigade combat teams in Europe and the future of those, and how many we want to maintain there, as well as specific uh, force posture issues and and, and other uh, regional force posture issues are all part of a, a ongoing review right now. So we can expect decisions yep. in the absolutely several month time frame. I'm not going to put a schedule on, but you can expect decisions. In a reasonable time yeah. frame. Perfectly reasonable time frame. That seems, that seems good. Uh, not surprising, Bill, there are a lot of questions uh, about uh, cyber, and let me uh, uh, just give you some of them. Um, here's one that says, you recently outlined a robust strategy to defend DOD's networks in cyberspace. The Pentagon has just launched Cyber Command. How will your efficiencies initiative affect the cyber accounts apart from eliminating NII? Well, I mean, two things there. I, the, the Cyber Command was part of an effort that we had, and the, the article you mentioned that described that more fully, but it, it, fundamentally we're treating cyberspace now as a domain of warfare. And we, so we need to take the steps operationally, doctrinally, training, uh, uh, force provision to do, to, to uh, accomplish that, treating uh, cyberspace as a domain of war. Standing up the Cyber Command was a significant part of that. So that, that is actually part of the, the war fighting side of the equation. That said, I, I mentioned, and we are looking in terms of the back office information technology uh, functions, the business systems that operate the department. We are, we are definitely looking at ways that we think we can do that, that IT operation more effectively. Uh, it doesn't mean reductions in cyber command, but it would, it would mean that we think that we can accomplish the, the kind of IT functions that all large organizations have. We think that there are best practices out there utilizing cloud computing and so on that are going to allow us to save, uh, save money. Again, on cybersecurity, um, and I, I see we're heading towards the end of our the time. The guy with the hook is. The guy with the hook is standing there. Uh, the question says, you've talked of active defenses uh, to protect the defense industrial base networks. What is the general state of protection today? What no, more needs to be done to protect these commercial <coughs> networks that the DOD uses? Well, as I talked about in the article, uh, DOD had an awakening in the 2008 time frame when we, we found that our uh, classified networks had been compromised. And we, we didn't think to that point that could happen. 
And uh, we, over the last two years, have undertaken a major effort to protect the, our, our networks to a much higher degree. And these are the dot mill networks. And we, we've used techniques we kind of put under the rubric of active defense. So they're more than just firewalls and, and intrusion detection devices. They're devices that allow you to hunt on your own network, to, to deal with uh, malware when you find it. Um, I, what I've put out in the article, and we've been discussing with, with Homeland Security, is the, the desirability and the prospect of using some of those active defense techniques to protect critical infrastructure areas, including the defense industrial base, and you know, potentially the power grid and so on. We're looking at that. This is a Department of Homeland Security responsibility in terms of the lead government role, but DOD uh, has capabilities that might be uh, utilized uh, in supporting Homeland Security, and that we're in the, in the middle of discussions on that. Let me close with uh, two questions uh, that are related but not the same about contractors. Mm -hmm. uh, one question points out that uh, we have many, many contractor personnel out in the field. Uh, in fact, some who have actually suffered casualties and, and mm -hmm. uh, in fact, a number have been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, how do you see this trend either continuing or not continuing in the future, the use of contracts in, I would call it combat arenas, if that's a usable a word. And then the, the second question becomes, um, if you're gonna cut back on, uh, to, I think what you call it was support contracts, mm -hmm. um, do you see that the efficiencies gained there are gonna be transferred into other contracting type of activities or more main, more for U.S. government personnel, that is to say added military, added civilian SESs who you also wanted to cut. So the, the, the overall state of how we're gonna use contractors in the future, I think, was the thrust of these questions. Well, let me answer the second first. The, the answer to the second is we are trying to reduce the overall size of the staff, both, both the headquarters staff, the admin staff, the support staff, and that's both contractors, that's the support activities, as well as government personnel. So the idea would not be to, to increase the total, the idea is to de decrease the total. The contractors in theater is a different challenge. I would not put those under the, the, the category of support. You know, that, that's not staff augmentation. There, the, the challenge there is what is the appropriate role for contractors in theater? And I think that's, we have built up over the course of the wars, uh, a, a very substantial number. We cannot operate without those contractors. But the question is, do we have them I entirely in the right roles? Uh, and we need, we, we are, with congressional urging, are going back and, uh, and looking at, are, do we have contractors in roles they shouldn't be performing? That wouldn't be an efficiency issue. That's more of an inherently governmental function versus, versus a, an appropriate contractor function. And I think we do need to review that and and we are we are undertaking that and that's that's certainly been the uh, the focus there. I, I was told I could ask two more questions, so I'm going to, okay. uh, and, and that'll be it. Uh, one go, again goes back to cyber. Uh, we've all or most of us have heard about the so-called Stuxnet malware that's attacked various, uh, in this case, uh, supposedly the Iranian nuclear program, but in any event, uh, Siemens, uh, SCADA controllers across mm -hmm. the world. Um, is this something that you think is going to affect us deeply, that is to say, both the department and the department's responsibility to protect more than it does now, not only the military networks, but potentially to reach out to protect the critical infrastructure networks uh, of the United States? Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think Stuxnet indicate, uh, illustrates two things. One, it illustrates the difficulty of attribution. Uh, for uh, cyber, uh, cyber intrusions. And two, I think it indicates the, uh, that, that the threat is, is broad, that it, that it can, and the, as I indicated in the article, I, I don't think we can just, in a national security realm, look at just protecting the dot mill networks. We have to think about the economy and we have to think about the networks that support military and security activities. So I, as, in, in, as I said in answer to the earlier question, I think we do need to think about uh, what kind of techniques 
is, is it appropriate to use and you know how again uh, it's a homeland security led uh, enterprise but what's what's the appropriate st role for the government uh, in protecting those infrastructure networks and the, the last question and this uh, if you will you can put on your uh, lawyer your congressional uh, your private citizen hat uh, there's always a, a balance between national security and free speech. Uh, how much do you keep secret? How much do you keep classified? How much do you mm -hmm. uh, put out in the public? Uh, and the, the question focused around the uh, recent WikiLeaks affair, the 90,000 or so documents. Mm -hmm. But to, to broaden that out, uh, what's your feeling about this, you know, the use of uh, uh, national security letters, which happened in the last administration a great deal, the issue of the uh, national security secrets, which is invoked uh, periodically in, in uh, legal cases, and the WikiLeaks. I mean, are you comfortable with where we are? Do we need to get more out to the public? Do we have, have we have enough out there? Uh, you have a book like Bob Woodward's, uh, where senior members of the administration gave him a lot of time, and so you get what at least purports to be uh, verbatim conversations of, of uh, activities. Uh, just this broad sense of national security versus uh, free speech. Do you have a? Well, I mean, I have a law degree, as you indicated, but I never really, I really only practice at cocktail parties. So, uh, uh, and since you're not serving, I'm not uh, going to. Um, Bring the man a drink. The, the, um, I, I actually would come at the, the, the WikiLeaks a little bit differently. I mean, the issue there is the, the breadth of, of available documents, and we've intentionally moved towards a world where we have available to the warfighter all of the intelligence we think they might need. And that's, that's not something we want to walk back. On the other hand, we need to make sure that information is protected. So I think we have to be creative in that area, and I think techniques like uh, credit card companies use to identify anomalous behavior. If, if somebody downloads 100,000 documents, maybe we ought to go visit. Uh, and, 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 may, and maybe they have a reason. Uh, you know, maybe they're doing some big report and there's a good reason. But we ought to at least check. Or if we see them you know, way outside of their area of responsibility, you, you can, the way they do, you know, if you, when, if you do a charge in, in, in Delhi and you haven't been in Delhi in five years, you probably get a call from your credit card company. Uh, so I, I think there are techniques that don't necessarily limit the access but can better better protect uh, the information. Well, let me uh, thank Bill. Let me ask all of you to thank Bill. It's been a terrific presentation. I also would like to thank uh, Deputy Secretary Lynn and our chairman for moderating this discussion. I want to thank you all for coming and, and remind you that on December 15th, we have a sequel event. Uh, we have Stephen Hadley and Bill Perry, who co-chaired the congressionally mandated QDR review, which will be a wonderful follow-on this to, to this discussion. Thank you all for coming, and see you on December 15th. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.